Good morning, folks. We're getting started as fast as I can. It's a little earlier than usual. I've been calming down from my recent battles. No, I don't have my hearing aids in. I think the sound's better for that. And uh, the Bose Bluetooth headset microphone. That's off beside the bed as well. I think that sounds better, too. I think combined works pretty good, although it looks kind of weird to have that black apparatus on my bald head. Look, we got to talk, and we don't have that much time. So what I want to cover, if I can, are strategic interventions to recover the Republic. And I haven't thought this out. And there are several interventions that I can think of, several strategic interventions. What do I mean by strategic intervention? It means it's pivotal. In other words, if you do this particular action, it acts like a pivot point. You remember doing seesaws as a child. Whoever had, well, I mean, some of us had more weight than others. Sometimes we would, uh, well, we would change the point of the fulcrum, you know, and it was kind of like a, a tug of war, but, you know, in the air as to who dominated on, you know, the seesaw. Kind of funny, isn't it? How those childhood games lead to such profound lessons. Okay. Maybe we are children after all. <clears throat> oh, so I'm going to focus on what I think are important strategic steps. And I know you're going to say, which one do we do first, Doc? Kent, which one? And I don't know. I don't know which one we can pull off. First and foremost, wherever we start, it's going to be good. Why is it going to be good? Because we're going to take action. And if it's the wrong action, we will at least learn from it and be able to better do it from there. Now, my favorite strategic intervention has always been the original 13th Amendment because it fixes a lot of things at one time. But I've got other people who talk about the, uh, the money system and restoring to constitutional currency. And constitutional currency doesn't mean gold. It means gold and silver coin. Okay. And uh, what, what else was there? Oh, there's another. There's a woman who ran for Congress who had great insight. And her, she didn't make it. But her insight was that we don't have um, organic governments. Our organic governments are left fallow. They are empty which means that all we have to do is ignore these corporate governments. I prefer to call it a shit show because I think it's all a bunch of actors and actresses putting on a show so that they pretend that we have a voice and we have representation. You see, I think we live in the biggest police state ever, ever on the face of the earth. I think we live in a slave state. That's what I think the United States of America has become. So her idea is you ignore these governments. And she likes going starting at the state government letter, level. She says, basically, you ignore what's going on and you elect people to the proper seats. You sit them and you start doing the business of the people. Notice I said the business of the people, not the business of the state, the corporation. Hmm. There's got to be some other strategic interventions that can be considered. And which one do we start with? I don't know. And I don't care. As long as we get started. Oh, oh, oh. I forgot about that one, that pesky one. Where you have to buy one of my Bibles, ideally. Or whatever Bible you got handy. And you sit on your ass and you read it. And you start living according to that. And you abide by those Ten Commandments. Now, if you read the Ten Commandments in Exodus, that's great. But the real meat and potatoes are in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And it is a double witness. It's in the Bible twice. And what does that mean? What have I told you? It means God is saying, pay attention to this. It's in here twice. Yahweh, Creator, Father God, really wants you to learn this. He wants you to pay attention to this. 
So we have a double witness in the Bible in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. One on the blessings for obedience. Obedience to what? The Ten Commandments. It's not send suggestions, it's Ten Commandments. And they are manifold, especially that one about adultery. That's not just about cheating on your wife. It's about watering down your seed. It's about marrying outside of your kind. It's about destroying your people. And no, you don't think of it that way. You need to think of it that way. It is another form of warfare. Oh, and it's not new. Who did it originally? Come on, it's in the Bible. If you read the Bible, you'd realize that the Samaritans were the result of that kind of warfare. And that's the warfare that's going on right now. That's the war that you and I are living through right now. It is World War III, especially as envisioned by our founding father, George Washington. George Washington had several visions an angel, male angel, no wings, mind you. This guy shows up in his dreams three times, three nights in a row. Or was it four? I don't have a good source on this, so I don't trust it either. So I don't trust anything. That's just the way it should be. You should question everything. <clears throat> I suppose we could. We could invoke the Holy Spirit, too. I mean, that would be revolutionary, if anything was. I mean, that would be really bringing the kingdom of heaven on the earth. I like that one. I like it best. That's the hardest one to do, I'm sure. George Washington had an angel visit him several nights in a row. And it, it always began that the angel would bring him up to consciousness or wake him up and say, son of the revolution. Basically, get your ass up and pay attention. Arise. I don't think he said, tell me what you see, but it might have been that way. I, as I said, I just, I don't have a good a good source on this, and it appears the source was documented and written down years after George Washington's passing by a descendant of a slave, I think, at that. So, who knows? I mean, that kind of throws it off because most of the slaves could not read. <clears throat> the angel proceeded to show George Washington the future of America. I believe this was in Valley Forge, by the way, during the hardship of hardships, you know, in the wintertime when he watched his men suffering, they didn't have good clothes or boots. I think they left blood on their trails when they walked those things too. That must have been pretty rough on the general to see his men suffering like that. So, the first night, the first vision, what's he see? I think this angel was putting on a show for him, and I believe there were black clouds rising. Now, Washington was up in the air watching this stuff, okay? That's his perspective. So the angels waking him up, taking him far above the earth. And above the continent of Africa, black clouds form, rising off the land. The black clouds form, and then they drift across the Atlantic Ocean on to North America. And the clouds descended upon North America. And there was great fighting in the clouds fog of war, if you will. That was our very uncivil war. Why do we call it the Civil War? It was either the war between the states or the war of northern aggression. That's the one I like best. I think it's really the honest description of what occurred.
The Civil War was anything but civil. So, he foresaw the Civil War. What year was that in? 1776? And I guess it was the next night the angel arrived and said, uh, Son of the Revolution, arise! <laughs> that night, that vision was of World War I. Wish I had better sources for this. I'd love to have more details for you, but I just don't. So he saw World War I coming. And then the next night, same dude shows up. Angel says, wake your ass up. Tell me what you see. Or he shows him anyway. World War II. Okay. Like I said, I wish I had a better source. I wish I had better details. It's quite a story, isn't it? And he comes back the next night. Angel wakes him up with son of the revolution. <clears throat> and revolution means return to self-rule. It doesn't mean revolt. We were already independent. We weren't fighting for our independence. We were fighting for our lives at that point. Yahweh doesn't bless rebellion. Remember that. Yahweh blesses self-defense, which is what we should be fighting for right now. We aren't defending ourselves very well. But this last vision, this last time the angel shows up at Valley Forge, <laughs> he shows red clouds arising off every continent on the face of the earth. And the red clouds drift, all of them drift, over North America. All of these red clouds unite over the continent of North America. And then they settle to the ground. And we fight among ourselves again. And the angel told him that we would prevail and that we would not be challenged again, that we would win this particular Third World War, this war against the communists. You need to understand red. Esau means red. Esau, I'm sorry, Edom means red. Esau's name was changed to Edom, meaning red. The symbolism for Esau is red. And if you want to know who Esau, Edom is today, you go to my blog, Giving Psychology Way. The home page of the blog, there are a series of tabs at the top of the page. You choose on the one who is Esau, Edom today. And you will get the full PDF book for a free download. Now, Charles Weissman was the name this fellow wrote under. That wasn't his real name. He wrote several books. And from what I heard, he was a really depressed dude. That's because, I think, because of the subject matter. And because he was by himself. He was breaking trail for you and me decades ago. And he wrote some incredible books, all biblically inspired, all based on the Bible. He lived alone. He wrote books. And when he passed away, it is said that he died with cases of books, brand new book, books in his house. He had them printed up. Cost them all the money to print books up. So he had them printed up big and bad cases of them. And so he probably had enough books there to raise a lot of money. But his family thought so highly of him 
that they carted off the cases of books, the cartons of books, to the dump and threw them out. And when I heard that story, I realized that all of these copyrights of his, they had been abandoned. They are now in the public domain. So when I found that book, I put it up there, and you will read the little <clears throat> disclaimer I give at the beginning that if you have a right to these copyrights, if you own those, tell me and I'll take it down. I don't want to infringe upon your copyrights, but this book is too important. This book is way too important to abandon it. So you'll get it. And there's a few other free resources there on my blog. Go and download it. Don't just bother to sit there and read it and tear up the bandwidth on my website and my blog. Go ahead and download it and save it to your computer. It's not that long. It's easy to read. He wrote very well. I read it very carefully. I analyzed it. There were only one or two things that I disagreed with. And there were such minor problems, I don't even remember what they were. Esau Edom rules the roost today, runs the planet today. Esau Edom did that horrible stuff to our brothers in Russia more than a century ago. Esau Edom has been in the background, spoiling things for a long time. And Mystery Babylon rules by deceit and deception. <sighs> Why don't I, I trust the story I just gave you? Because it was written down and recorded well after George Washington's death. There was another man that lived after Washington, Albert Pike, General Albert Pike. He was a Yankee general, a Union general. He had long hair and a beard, a little on the heavy side. He was famous for um, his work with the Indians in the state of Mississippi. I keep forgetting the name of those Indians in Mississippi and the tribe name, but he worked with them. I guess he pacified them or something to that, but he worked with them. That's what he was famous for. He also kind of stayed in the background. You don't hear much about him. However, he wrote a famous letter. Maybe it was a series of letters. Probably it was a series of letters. But one in particular is under glass and on display on Great Britain. I haven't seen the letter. I haven't been there. I'd love to be there. I don't want to travel outside of the nation right now. I'm cheap ass. I can't afford that. I have other priorities. But apparently this letter was from General Pike to his protege, the man who followed in his footsteps, leading the evil upon the earth. And that would have been Mancini, an Italian gentleman who is said to be the father of the mafia. And in Mancini, he outlined his plans for World Wars I, II, and three. We've already had World Wars I and II, according to that letter. When was the letter drafted? When was it written? Sometime after the start of our uncivil civil war, way before the 20th century. It was back in the 19th century, almost the middle of it. So as you can see, this stuff is long-range planning. It's long-term planning. It is intergenerational. It's multi-generational. The evil ones have been hiding their tracks for years by censoring the literature, according to Eustace Mullins. As he said, at least 3,000 years, they censor the literature so we won't be able to track them down and identify them. 
I don't trust the story of George Washington and the angel visiting him at Valley Forge because it was written down well after his death and it was awfully close to when Albert Pike was alive. Albert Pike is the architect of these world wars, including the one we're going through right now, in which the communists have risen from all of the continents around the world. They have drifted here, and we are now fighting them, or we will begin shortly to have that physical fight among ourselves, that second civil uncivil war. There's another strategic intervention, and I rather like it, and that is to realize that the most powerful part of our original government no longer exists. They took it away from us in 1902, more than a century ago. As I said, this is long-range planning, long-term stuff. And stop looking outside of the country at the Chinese. And stop blaming the other son of a bitch. Go look in the mirror. You're the one that's in the way. Yeah, you refuse to read the Bible. You refuse to abide by the Ten Commandments. You refuse to realize who you are, what you are. You refuse to worship the one true God, Yahweh. And as a result of that, all those curses for disobedience, to, and that's to the Ten Commandments, it's in the Bible, not once but twice, and the curses section is twice as long as the section for blessings. You better read it. That's how I helped understand the nation that we're living in today and what's going on. You know, these big box churches, oh, the United States of America is not in the Bible. It's nowhere to be found in the Bible. Liars and thieves. It's in the Bible, starting in the book of Genesis. There's not, not some good stuff. There's some not so good stuff. There's some horrible stuff written about us in there. And at this point, it's kind of a crapshoot. It could go in any direction. Don't think it's all written in stone, cast in stone. Yes, I know it's in the Bible. But does that mean it has to come to full fruition? I don't think so. You know, you're going to say, well, I don't know, Dr. Kent doesn't believe the Bible. Well, I think the Bible is a very flexible document, living and breathing. I think it's, I think it's how you access the mind of God, the mind of Creator Father Yahweh. I think it's how you build the Holy Spirit. I think it's how you live, how you come alive. It's by sitting on your butt, reading the Bible, and coming to understand it. Infusing yourself with good stuff. Putting good stuff in so you're not getting any garbage out. I don't like this angle much. It's going to slip in my little stand, my makeshift stand here. So... What was, oh, let me ask you a question. This is a serious question. What is the most powerful branch of our government? What is the most powerful branch of our government as it was founded, as it was begun, as our, our framers did it, as our founding fathers invented it? and gave it to us. I know you're going to say, well, my God, Dr. Kent, there are three co-equal branches of the federal government. Anybody knows that. Everybody knows that. Oh, really? Really? You know that? Well, when we read the uh, Constitution, which I think is the uh, kind of the Fourth Testament, if you will, the Third Testament being the Declaration of Independence, which one of my ancestors was the first to sign. Not the last, the very first to put his life, put his name, his life, his fortune on the line. By the way, he was one of the uh, signers, one of the 50 who actually survived and did well. So how come I'm here? You and I need to thank all of our ancestors that got us here.
This is why I went to battle recently for the Kents, for all of those men and women that were involved in getting, begatting me. I owe them all. Don't you owe your ancestors too? Of course you do. Okay. Where was I at? The most important branch of the government is the Congress. It's not the uh, executive branch. It's the legislative branch. It's not the presidency. See, he doesn't have the powers to make war or the powers of the purse. Only the Congress has that. Not even the doggone Senate. It's the Congress. And you'll say, well, the, uh, the, the judiciary, I mean, my God, Dr. Kent, they, they rule the roost. They, they judge everything. They sit over on all of it. But that's another co-equal branch, right? Let's see. They can't name their own salaries. They have no control of that. Hmm. You look at the history, the country didn't even abide by many of their doggone judgments. They didn't have much power. It was kind of like the Supreme Court of Suggestions. No, no, the Congress is far more powerful than the Supreme Court, the judiciary. But you're forgetting a branch of government that was so ubiquitous, so widespread that it was hardly mentioned in the Constitution. It was taken for granted. It was a way of life. It gave us our self-rule. They took it away in 1902 with the Militia Efficiency Act of 1902, otherwise called the Dick Act, where they stuck us with a big Johnson and put the screws to us. They sucker punched us. They got us to pass that stupid act based upon the promise that it would forever protect our Second Amendments. We didn't need it. Second Amendment's in the Constitution. We didn't need an act to support it or undermine it, which is what it did. You see, the most powerful branch of our government was the people, and the people were the militia. It wasn't a militancy. It's kind of like a good old boys club. We supported each other. When there was a problem, we worked on it together. We took arms together. We showed up together in arms. We didn't let each other hang out and abandon each other. We addressed it together as men. Yeah, I know. We're not allowed to be men. Yeah, I know. So, the militia was the biggest branch of our government, the most powerful branch of our government. As a matter of fact, talk about gun control and gun laws. The laws of the early days were you were required to have a long rifle and a, a pistol and a short sword and so many rounds of, of ball, so many, so much a measure of powder, you were required to keep that in your house. Those were the laws. Everybody had to have these guns. And I believe some places they actually legislated that you had to have a musket and a rifle. Why a musket? Well, rifles had the screws, the thread in the barrel, and you had to you had to push everything down there, and it had to rotate and turn down through that rifling, and it loaded from the muzzle in. It took longer to reload your rifle. It was more accurate, much more accurate. It could go further distances, but you couldn't reload very fast because you had to push the the wad, the powder, the ball. You had to push all that in using the ramrod. You had to push it in. And so your reload time was too damn long in a rifle. So every man carried two long guns. You carried a musket, a smoothbore musket, 
which you could reload faster. You could shove stuff right into that thing and shoot again. That's why it was important to have them both. You started with your rifle, and then you went immediately to your smoothbore, and you kept shooting with the smoothbore because you could repeat fire quickly. <clears throat> what other countries freer than America? Most of them, in case you want to know. Dumbass. The Swiss. The Swiss. You know, every adult Swiss man is trained up. Every adult Swiss man is issued a full battle rifle. Are you... Do you own a battle rifle? That AR-15 isn't a battle rifle. The Swiss have selectable fire. Full auto, triburst. In their homes. They're issued by the government. They are trained up during their drafted period of service, required period of service in their army over there. And they are sent home with the rifle they were trained upon, required to keep it and keep it secured. But you and I aren't even allowed to own those here in America. We ship them abroad all the time. We supply those things to all these other nations, to the guys in Africa, the Middle East, Afghanistan. I mean, we send these these guns all over the world. Then Americans are no longer allowed to have them possessed because they're too dangerous. Hogwash. <clears throat> our, we've been infringed upon. And the biggest problem is we don't have a militia. And if you read the Constitution, you will see in two, in two parts of the Constitution, kind of a double witness like in the Bible. You will see that there are two tasks specific to the militia. One is to quell insurrections, put down the riots. And the other is to defend our borders. Yes, that's in the Constitution. You form a militia, you go defend the borders, you can take that to the Supreme Court and defend it. The state will fight you. The government, our federal government, our corporate, or one of the four corporations of the federal government will take you to task and take you to court and sue you over that. Ultimately, the Supreme Court, if you get your way through the federal system, the Supreme Court would, would maybe give you standing and maybe take the case, in which case, in the event of that, they would be required to read the Constitution and follow it for a change. So you can't defend your borders because the federal government won't let you do it as a state government. Wow. Oh, and by the way, militias were both public and private. The states had their militias, and there were private ones. Ethan Allen had his own militia. Ethan Allen and his Green Mountain men. Yeah, there were several militias throughout the states. And the incident at Exeter in New Hampshire... They had moved the state capital from Portsmouth inland to Exeter because they felt it was too vulnerable to the British, and it was. The British could have just brought their ship, Navy ships right up there and pounded the hell out of it with their cannons sitting offshore. So they moved it to Exeter. And there was some legislation. I don't remember what the course of business was. And it could have gone one of two ways. And it had to do with a property. And... The legislators were dilly-dallying. They weren't doing their jobs. And the militia decided to ride their asses. So, when the legislators went into the building to hold the session, the militia surrounded it. And they sent a man inside to inform the legislators, the inferior branch of their government. Gentlemen, this is the business at hand. You will do your duty. And no one leaves until you get this done. Not only that, no one enters the building until this is done. No food and no drink will be delivered to you until you get this legislation written. And they basically kidnapped the whole damn legislature. All of them. 
held them in the building till they got the business of the people done. Now that's power. Oh, and you wanted to go arrest somebody or you needed to defend against somebody? You joined up with your militia buddies and you went together. And if you had an errant law enforcement officer, let's say one of the sheriff's deputies had broken the law, the militia showed up and took him into custody and delivered him to the judge. Charges were leveled. A trial ensued. You see, the militia was were the enforcers. They worked together. Not, but, not much violence or bloodshed was needed because who's going to go against 50 or 100 men? Nobody in their right mind. You're going to allow yourself to be taken custody. You're going to surrender. And of course, if you know what I'm talking about, you'd be saying, okay, I accept. You accept the arrest. Where's the bond? Only free men demand a bond. And you have to give it or you can't take them into custody. I learned that from an inmate while working in the Department of Corrections. Brilliant, brilliant young man. If you're out there watching this, I hope you're doing well. I didn't like watching what you went through, what you had to go through. I ain't going to make that public, and it'd be a violation of ethics. You have some very good qualities about you. I want to tell you that. <clears throat> Strategic interventions, or major interventions, when you do it, lots of things change. The strategic intervention of the thir original 13th Amendment is kind of my idea and kind of not my idea. I have to give credit to Eustace Mullins, to the author, because he's the one that pointed it out. I'm the one that made it a strategic intervention based upon family therapy systems, therapy, if you will systems theory. So if you change and restore the original 13th Amendment, which, by the way, really is the law of the land. So if you abide by the law and put that in there, your 14th and 15th Amendment, according to Eustace Mullins, were, were, um, were dictated to against the southern states before they had any representation. They did not elect their senators or their legislators. They weren't represented. Therefore, those are null and void. Those were imposed upon the South. It was not the will of the people. They did not have representation. So, And by the way, the 14th Amendment is the amendment whereby they enslaved us all. So that goes by the wayside as well as all legal precedent based upon that stupid, ugly amendment that created a citizen of the United States and made blacks three-tenths of a man. And then the 16th Amendment, your IRS, your, your income tax amendment, was never even voted on. They didn't even vote on it. How can that be legal if they didn't even vote on it? And the rest of the amendments, actually including the 16th Amendment, it may be argued, are out of order and rendered null and void in one sweep. That's what we should be doing. Starting all over with what our founders gave us, with the original 13th Amendment ratified by all the states in 1812. As a result of the War of 1812, and the attorneys the Bar Association members got us into the War of 1812. And that was the purpose of the original 13th Amendment, was so the attorneys wouldn't be able to do that to us again. But unfortunately, those Bar Association members spread their shit all over the land, and they screwed us up really badly. 
Most of the attorneys don't even know what they're doing. They don't even understand this stuff. Go get that blue colored covered book, Fruit from a Poisonous Tree, written by an attorney named Stanford. When he finished the book, he gave it to judges, retired judges who were distraught when they realized what they had been do what they had done, what they had been doing. Especially when they realized they were no longer accepting common law pleas. They were no longer honoring a man's constitutional rights. But they were only taking statutory pleas in violation of the Constitution. Almost every conviction since 1964 has been that way. What else happened in 1964, by the way? Well, we had a spike in criminal activity. Yeah, lots more men went to prison that year. Gee, what else happened that year? Who was president? Oh, murderer-in-chief, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who had murdered his president, John F. Kennedy. What else happened? Well, the Vietnam War. The Supreme Court made an ugly, very unconstitutional ruling went against the very foundations of our government. They took prayer out of school. As a result, crime spiked. So, for you who do not like Yahweh, and for you who want to turn your backs on God or keep turning your backs on God, yeah. What fools, what fools we've been played for, we've been taken for. You want this nation back? You turn to Yahweh, just like our forefathers did in ancient Israel. You want to know where um, the promised land is? You want to know who the chosen people are? The odds are you're, you're <laughs> well, you tuned into this channel. You got to be pretty eccentric to tune into this eccentrics channel. So if you look in the mirror, the odds are you're going to be looking at several things at one time and not even realize it. You are the new temple. This is the new Jerusalem. We are home. We are Israelites. And if you can get that Holy Spirit cranked up inside you and going, and you can do about anything, the Spirit will guide you. Not Dr. Kent. Not me. It's very much an individual thing. The Spirit's going to tell you and reveal things to you differently than it reveals them to Dr. Kent. And I dare say some of you are going to be much greater than I. I pray for you that you are. We need strong men. And we need strong ladies, too. Women are the backbone of our morality. Now, I didn't invent that saying, but you can cite me for it. My paternal grandmother, I own Griffin Kent, told me that as one of the lessons sitting in her parlor in her house in Newmarket, New Hampshire. I loved my grandmother. She was college educated in 1907. Most men had sixth grade educations back then. That's all you needed to function and work in our society. You didn't have to go to high school and graduate high school. The sixth grade education was the equivalent. Actually, the sixth grade education was better than a high school education today. And that college education my grandmother had, I dare say it beat the snot out of my doctorate. Yeah. It's before they dumbed us down, watered it all down. <sighs> Folks, they're, uh, they're, it was said at a funeral in 1868. Yeah, 1868. We're talking long-range planning, intergenerational warfare. 
One rabbi was being buried, and the rabbi who was eulogizing him said, We will pull the rug out from underneath them at a time of our own choosing. I'm not sure what he was referring to, and in case you're wondering, that was in Tex Mars books. One of his books, he documented that so we would all know it. Yeah, I think he named the rabbis as well, but but they made that statement. Now, you folks out there need to know something. The roots are so tangled that you can't separate us. And you will know them by their fruits, by their labors, by what they do. And I got a guideline for you. If somebody's not kind, turn your back on them, walk away. If a person is not kind, you don't want anything to do with them. That way you can avoid a lot of evil in your life. Only deal with kind people. I don't care if they call themselves Christians or not. If they aren't kind, screw them. My God, my brother told me a story yesterday about a woman who, uh, during the funeral of her second husband, admitted she had murdered her first husband. And this was a woman who actually praised the Lord in about every uh, third sentence, maybe every other sentence. She was a devout, you know, fine Christian woman. And there she was. She admitted she had murdered her first husband. Oh, they were out boating. She pushed him in the water. And then she hit him in the head with the oar and held his ass underwater. She killed him. And there's supposed to be sugar and spice and everything nice. Men, the Bible says clearly that only one out of a thousand of us is honest and not one out of 10,000 women. Women are given extra... I'm going on. I shouldn't do that anymore. I'm probably going to lose you at this point. But I, I just want to tell you that I love you. I care for you deeply. You've tuned into this channel. Last I checked, I might have had a dozen subscribers. That's all. Don't share this um, openly on social media. Send this specifically to people you want to bless. Let's keep this a small club. They don't like me very much. They don't like us very much. You see, the devil and his children own and rule the planet just like it was when Yeshua the Messiah walked the face of the earth. <laughs> yeah, devil took him off for 40 days, after the 40 days and 40 nights in the desert, you know, and all that. No, actually, it was before that. Remember the temptations of Christ. That's what it was taught. That's what we called him when I was a little boy in Sunday school. But, um... The devil offered him all of the kingdoms of the earth, showed them all to him at one time, and says, this is all going to be yours. You just have to get down and worship me. And of course, Yahshua the Messiah resisted that and rebutted the devil. Isn't it time you rebut the devil? You have to understand it's not one group of people. It's not one class of people. And I don't even like calling them people, but they are intertwined among us. We have a huge number of sociopaths in the American population. It used to be 4%. That's all, one out of every 25 of us, back when it was stable. But they have destabilized through this unorthodox warfare, which they learned from the Assyrians, which the Assyrians imposed upon the Israelites, thus creating the Samaritans. Yeah, read your Bible about the story about the Good Samaritan. The reason it was amazing is because he was one of the products of the psychological, well, it wasn't just psychological, it was real physical warfare that the Assyrians waged against Israel so that they would never be able to rise, lift their heads up again. And of course, if you want to go see an Israelite, look in the mirror. The odds are, if you're looking at my channel, you're full Israelite. And if not, you're mostly Israelite. And if not that, at least part Israelite. And yet, we have brought the Bible to the entire world as a blessing. Those who abide by the Ten Commandments get the blessing right in the here and now. They don't have to wait till they die. They get it now. They get to walk upright. Don't you like that? 
Don't you want everybody to walk upright and obey natural laws, obey God's laws, obey the Ten Commandments? Isn't that a good idea? So stop telling people it ain't for them. Share this wealth. Share this blessing. Share this gospel. My Lord, they pick up the Bible and do better at it than we do. But I have a way there's a problem. The devil and his children read the Bible too and they know it better than we do. And they use it as a playbook against us. Yeah. I know. It's very complex. It's almost convoluted. There's so much to it. But you have to understand something. It says clearly it was going to be sent great delusion so you wouldn't make it. Come out of the delusion, folks. Give up your, give up the falsehoods. Give up these half-truths. Give up this stuff that obscures the truth and reality. We don't celebrate Christmas. We celebrate tabernacles. We celebrate the Passover. Those were dictated and we were told to celebrate those in perpetuity forever. Why was that? Why do we celebrate the Passover and tabernacles forever? What happened during those days that happened in the future? Man, Yeshua showed up. He was born during the Feast of Tabernacles. He was died. Now, some of us will argue he didn't die. Some will say he was murdered. And others will say, well, if he didn't die, how can we claim there was a murder? Yeah, these are great mysteries, folks. But we do know this. Easter was a pagan holiday. And Easter's mentioned only one time in the Bible. It's in the New Testament. Go read it and find out for yourself. So we rightfully should be celebrating the Passover because that's when the crucifixion and the rising, the crucifixion, the burial, and the rising occurred. Those were all predecessors, all visions, if you will, of the future to come. That's what makes it so incredible. I mean, stuff was written about 900 years before it occurred. Wow. That's what I call a prophet. Okay, folks. I don't know if this is number 10 or number 11. I'll have to fire up my computer and see. If you stayed with me this long, I can definitely tell you I love you. Storge. I keep using that word because it's the hardest to remember of the four different forms of love in the Greek language. The others are pretty easy to remember, but not storge. It's such a weird word. S-T-O-R-G-E is how we spell it in the anglicized version, in the transliterated version. I think that's the way to say it properly. Anyway, it's all Greek to me. And by the way, the Bible was not written in Greek, folks. And the Greek Orthodox Bible is not the best Bible. You want the best Bible, you follow the link that's in the description down below. It'll take you to a page. And uh, I get a little stipend off that. Not much, but I get something. And you get more value than you're giving. You get the best Bible in the world. We have corrected the errors of Ptolemy II in 275 B.C., wherein he took out the name of Yahweh and put in the generic term God throughout. Was he a good guy or a bad guy? We don't know. We haven't debated that very much. That's a question for me and my brothers to come up with. I ask people, and um, and the reason I ask is because I know it has to sit through the, uh, the body of Yahshua, body of Christ, if you want to call it that. I prefer to call him the Messiah. That's the word that's really in the text of the New Testament, by the way. Christ is only mentioned a few times, maybe a half a dozen times. Messiah is mentioned many, many times. Why is that? Why is that throughout the Bible? Doesn't Yahweh want you to pay attention to that? You have a good day, folks. Yahweh bless.